And I get most of the credit, uh, undeserved, uh, for the great program, great program, programming at the City Club of Chicago. But it really is the next speaker who really is the person behind the debates, behind all the speakers, Dr. Paul Green. Doctor, it's all yours. Uh, well, thanks all for coming. You know, this event would have sold out. Uh, um. <laughs> they just wouldn't put it on the advertisement. Uh, anyways, I want to uh, thank all of you for coming. We're going to start right now, but I want to mention a couple of people who un unbelievably Jay missed. First, Mr. Tom Chang from the Thai, Thai, uh, Taiwan office, cultural and economic office. Uh, <laughs> And his buddy Hank Liu, uh, they had the great uh, misfortune of sending me to Taiwan to help with the elections, and you know how easy that turned out. So, uh, just saying, hey, Hank, take a bow. Uh, also, the young woman who was key to uh, putting this book, to helping us put together, and if you think it's easy to, to put a book together with Paul Green, you have no idea. Samantha, stand up. Samantha Gleason from Arcadia Press. There she is. Uh, Okay, the way this is going to work is that uh, Mel is going to start off and then I'm going to uh, be anchor. Uh, we are going to try and show you some of the photos that are in this book about World War II uh, and the uh, aftermath. Uh, the key to the book are the pictures of World War II and let me just, though he's been mentioned, uh, let me say it again. If it wasn't for John Cruikshank, this would be a very short program. The Sun-Times with Ron Toon in the library were absolutely wonderful in allowing us to go through their, their, uh, uh, our, their, their pictures. So John, thank you very much. And, uh, and I'm sure your lawyer still hasn't forgotten me. All right, so enough of that. Uh, one other thing before Mel gets on, and we have our Vanna White over here will be turning the uh, various uh, 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 overheads. Uh, it's a little too tough for either Mel or I to handle if you want to know the guy's honest truth. Uh, but one of the things that this book does do, more than if you're familiar with Arcadia, uh, they do a lot of photo books. But this, there is a forward and a postscript where Mel and I try in a few thousand words to try and capture the period from 1900 to 1941 and then from 1955 uh, to the present. Uh, if you really want to read the history of Chicago without reading a lot of history of Chicago, uh, this does give you a little bit of, a, of, of an overview. So, enough from me. Yes? Oh, please, if you can, because you know what? I'm, this is like going to the Louvre and sitting behind a post. Uh, uh, just grab your, well, if, you don't, if you'd rather, I, I understand if you'd rather eat. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, must be Italians, what can you say? Uh, let's begin. Mel Holly, start off and we'll uh, go. And remember, he has 12 minutes, so keep the count. <laughs> okay. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Melvin G. Right. <clears throat> this is the cover of the book, the photo, World War II Chicago. And as you can see, there is a whole group of children in 1943, gathering in. Turn the mic, turn the mic. Oh, gathering in scrap paper, scrap rubber tires, uh, copper wire, what have you, for recycling because the shortages of raw materials was enormous in World War II. And so these kids were out gathering stuff which could be recycled. Rubber, of course, could not be purchased because Japan had taken over Asia and there was a shortage over the world for all that stuff and rationing also was a result. It also tells us something else, however, in World War II, how it was supported by almost all adults and even children who worked very hard at helping to re get recycled materials. And here we have girls and boys and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts working very hard to get stuff for recycling for war production. Okay? Next. By the way, for those of you, next is the code. <laughs> All right. Now, this is 1940 in Chicago, and it's Fort Sheridan, where people were actually volunteering for the military in 1940 before the war began. And Fort Sheridan was a big army training post, one of the biggest in the Midwest here in Illinois, and these were people volunteering before the war actually began. Okay, the next image. 
<clears throat> All right. Now, in 1941, once the war was underway, uh, Mayor Ed Kelly in Chicago formed a servicemen center to accommodate the thousands of servicemen who came through Chicago in World War II. Enormous numbers came here. As you know, the Great Lakes Naval Station was nearby, and uh, these servicemen could stay <clears throat> overnight at the service center, or get food, what have you, helping. And Chicago was very generous because if you had an Army uniform or Navy uniform on, you did not have to pay to use a taxi or to use a bus or a trolley. Mayor wanted to make it a popular place for the military to be trained. Okay, the next image. All right, and here we have a picture of American Naval Patrol from Great Lakes in Grant Park in Chicago, marching around. And uh, on the bottom part, of, we have a picture of, say, Navy Pier, where Naval Patrolmen were taught how to use the communication system and cartology and war training. Navy Pier was indeed an important training site for the Navy along with Great Lakes Naval Air Station. It became in 1946 a branch of the University of Illinois when many GIs are looking for college educations. Okay, the next image. Now this is the one that surprises people. There were two passenger liners, the Wolverine and the Sobel, which were brought to Chicago and their decks were cleared. They were remodeled into aircraft carrier landing fields. And sure enough, Glenview Naval Air Stations trained some 10,000 American pilots on how to land on an aircraft carrier off Navy Pier in Lake Michigan. And the reasons for that were they were fearful about doing that in the Pacific or the Atlantic because German submarines or Japanese submarines might have sunk the trainers. So where was the safest place? The Midwest, Chicago, Lake Michigan. And some 10,000 flyers learned how to land aircraft here in Chicago from Glenview. And of course, if you went to the Pacific War Zone, the landing field was aircraft carriers because the US did not control many ground landing fields. And so that was a famous experiment. These passenger liners turned into aircraft carrier landing sites. And 10,000 is a lot of pilots. Next image, please. Uh, including George Bush Sr. Yeah, including George Bush Sr., who actually learned to fly here in Chicago and land on an aircraft carrier off Navy Pier. All right, this is the famous Chicago pilot, Butch O'Hare. And he was famous because in December 7th, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and killed 3,000 Americans and sank much of the Pacific fleet. And it looked very grim until January when this pilot shot down five Japanese Zero fighters that were trying to bomb the Lexington aircraft carrier. And he, was, he really got the first big victory for the Allies in the Pacific Theater. And uh, he was a famous pilot, Butch O'Hare. Next image. He was so famous that Franklin Roosevelt called him back to America in 1942. And here President Roosevelt is giving him a Congressional Medal of Honor as America's air ace at the beginning of the war period. And of course, uh, Orchard Field would be renamed O'Hare Airport once they built it after this famous uh, air ace. He was shot down in 1943 and killed, unfortunately, when FDR sent him back to the Pacific. Next image. Okay, and here is another famous army man, Joe Lewis, the heavyweight prize fighter who had just re-won the world championship for heavyweights in 1942 and he was here in Chicago and he enlisted into the army in 1942 and he became a very important image and icon for African Americans because they could say our image or our favorite icon is enlisting in the army. So many African Americans enlisted in the military. It also brought great public support for the American war effort, much more than we have today on the current conflict. But this was Joe Lewis, and that's Marva Lewis, his wife, when they were here in Chicago. It was a very famous enlistment, a good example for others who then enlisted too. Okay, the next image. 
All right, and this is the famous Italian-American, born in Italy, came to the United States, Enrico Fermi, and in 1942, they discovered that the Germans were racing to build an atomic bomb, and Fermi, of course, brought about nuclear fission, the first cracking of the atom in Stagg Field at the University of Chicago, and that would lead then to the Manhattan Project in America building the atomic bomb and winning the atomic bomb race over Germany and Japan, and of course ending World War II with the atomic bomb. And of course the Fermi Laboratory, which is west of Chicago, is named after this Italian immigrant, Enrico Fermi. And here's an American whack. Women were very important in World War II because the manpower shortages were enormous. By 1943, some 14 million American men had been inducted into the military, and the number would climb to 17 million by the end of the war. So it meant factories and industrial producers did not have workers that we needed, nor did the military. And so women enlist in, enlisting into the WACs helped to also form some of the people the military needed uh, for some security purposes. Okay, next. All right, and this is U.S. troops in Chicago again being uh, catered to by the Traveler's Aid Society. The Traveler's Aid Society was invented by Jane Addams, the founder of Hull House, a very famous social worker. And in World War II, the Traveler's Aid Society became a great help to American servicemen coming through the city or training here temporarily and going to the war front in the Pacific Theater or in the, in the Atlantic Theater. And so the Traveler's Aid Society would provide them with food and provide them with housing temporarily. And even some of the universities like Loyola and Northwestern provided dormitory housing for the military who are undergoing training here in Chicago in World War II. All right, next image. Okay, and here's Mayor Ed Kelly's wife playing the piano for American soldiers who were here for training. So Chicago was doing a great deal. Even the mayor's wife was helping to entertain the soldiers who were here in the city or the sailors in passing through. All right, the next image. Hey, get off that one fast. Pardon? <laughs> now, this, this is one which kind of surprises Americans occasionally. These are two women born in Japan. They came to Chicago in World War II, and they're displaying these flags. Each one has four sons serving in the American military in the famous Nisi Battalion that went to Italy to fight in World War II. Now, how did they get to Chicago? Well, as you know, Franklin Roosevelt in 1942 ordered 100,000 Japanese Americans taken off the Pacific coast and put into internment camps beyond the coastline because he feared that they would cooperate with the Japanese should they ever attack America. And so the internment camp Japanese could leave if they could find a job in a war industry uh, factory or come to the Midwest like Chicago and some 20,000 Japanese came to Chicago in World War II to work in the defense industry and all the other industries needed and as you can see uh, these two Japanese mothers were showing that their sons were serving in the famous Nisi Battalion. Nisi means second generation in Japanese and they served in Italy. And so that accounts for how Japanese Americans got here and helped to fill part of the great labor shortage that America was facing. Next image. Okay. Oh, the handoff, the handoff. <laughs> okay. All right. Great job for Melvin. <laughs> that was a smooth transition. <laughs> Seamless. By the way, I want to, two quick beats. I'm getting to be Dorot, Dorothy eyes. I want to introduce another good friend of mine, Olivia Moore from the British Consulate. Really, raise your hand. And of course, the Honorable Jill Zwick from the Secretary of State's office and Mary Ann Scallon from the Secretary of State's office. All right. Uh, the, Mel talked about the women in, in the workforce. And when we were looking for these, for these photos, there were a whole bunch of photos, there are more in the book about the various defense industries that were involved in hiring women to, to take up the, the shortage. Uh, it was uh, 
the, the changes that we write about after the war are based on part on by what happened during the war. In other words, women in the workforce was, was becoming, became the norm. And uh, here you have an example of International Harvester. Next, it's even a, a clearer image. Uh, our version of Rosie the Riveter. Uh, uh, and factories are all over the place, and everything was being turned into, uh, for a military, and as the cover shows, and you'll see a little later, rationing uh, you know, was truly uh, uh, something of huge importance. In fact, if you saw the interview last night or the night before of uh, Brokaw interviewing George Bush, Brokaw, who researched this in the, you know, the greatest nation, the, the greatest generation, whatever his title of his book is, asked the president about the sacrifices that were made in World War II and what sacrifices are Americans making today. And the president didn't have a very good answer. I don't think the president really understood what he was saying. Uh, in, in, in this case, there were tremendous sacrifices going on by everybody on the home front. Uh, for all of you CTA fans, despite World War II, progress must go on, Alderman, as you well know. Uh, this is the opening of the subway under, under State Street, and it's a lot clearer in the book. Uh, but what you, what, what you see is a, uh, uh, Ed Kelly, uh, uh, you know, once again, uh, obviously only for transportation purposes and to make commuting a lot easier regardless of the contracts and the jobs, because there was a war going on. As you'll see, some things didn't change, but the subway opened up in 43. Next. Uh, Mr. President, this is the Auditorium Theater. Uh, they turned the Auditorium Theater, Lewis Sullivan's 1889 masterpiece, into a bowling alley. And the, the military would come there and that they would, they would bowl in this rather nice surroundings. And uh, 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 clearly, uh, it's put to a lot better use now. Uh, uh, but uh, this was part of the whole idea of everyone pulling together. And the, uh, uh, the auditorium theater was one of the uh, main sites, the whole South Loop, with USO offices and everything else there. Next. Uh, one of the great patriots, uh, uh, Mr. Montgomery Ward, uh, Sewell Avery, uh, being uh, kicked out of his office. He wasn't exactly gung-ho for the war. What, what's the exact line you use them all about? Well, you wore a labor board. O open the, your microphone. Tell, tell them exactly what it was. Okay. Well, in 1944, uh, there was a strike at Montgomery Ward, and the military was unhappy because you were not supposed to strike during the wartime period. And Ward was a very important uh, producer of war materials as well. And so the Army, uh, the U.S. military, took over Montgomery Ward, and they carried out Sewell Avery, and they held on to it until 1945. So it became under control of the Chamber of Commerce and the American military for production purposes. And this is Sewell Avery being carried out of the office. Next. Uh, John Ashcroft was working there as an intern. Uh, no. uh. <laughs> the ration books. Uh, one of the most exciting part of the of the of the book is the various example of ration books. Uh, you to buy coffee, to buy meat, to buy all the things that we think that they, that that would be something that you normally do. You had to have these ration books, and I tried to explain the system, but I didn't understand. They're just reading it, let alone having to use it. But there's a picture in that we don't have here, but there's a shot in the book where you have the Kroger and the Jewel side by side. And at the Kroger, it's coffee day. And they have people around the block in line. The Jewel is not coffee day, empty. So being able to, in the home front to buy your, your groceries was absolutely uh, uh, crucial. And there's another shot that we don't have for time of a Bridgeport butchery, butcher where it was a meat, it's called it Meatless Tuesday or Frozen Tuesday, where you couldn't buy meat at all. And this guy was sort of taking a snooze. So there were a lot of sacrifices being done uh, by all segments of, the, of Chicago. Yes. The victory garden. Planting your, uh, planting your little vegetable garden, uh, your crops. This is at 82nd and Jeffrey, well known for its agricultural soil. Uh, uh, clearing an old scrap heap. Another one on the southwest side. These, these victory gardens, part of participation, as besides the vegetables. You literally had all segments of Chicago involved in Victory Gardens. I don't have to explain, you know, the difference between then and now, but this is a total commitment. Next. Keep going. That's the cover. Next. That's the cover of the book. The, the, Mel talked about it. The tires, the kids going around. The one on top, for all you businessmen, 
the gas shortage was so great in Chicago, that's Michigan Avenue uh, on Randolph Street, they would, they, these are three salesmen making their rounds on horseback because <laughs> they couldn't get gas. Uh, you also had a, uh, 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 today, this was, this, was, this was rush hour on State Street, right down there, rush hour on State Street. No, no one drove. And, and, and one of the things we discovered that if you did drive, you were scorned often. Why are you driving? You know, the boys at the front need the gas. I mean, this is amazing. And, and, and for someone who thought he knew a little bit about Chicago history, I was really surprised by the number of photos that we saw uh, about the, 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 the rationing, the issue of rationing. Alderman Dataris, just give him a round of applause. Alderman, here's your seat, because we want you to, Jay, sit next to Mr. Dorn. Right, Alderman. I think this nice lady is better looking. <laughs> That's why he's been in office for a long time. Okay. <laughs> next. Thank you. Next shot. Peace. This is it, the declaration, the, the Daily Times before the, uh, the merge. But notice, and to me, this was one of the most incredible of all the shots. The big headline piece. Isn't it wonderful? The next thing in bigger print, end gas ration. I mean, to, 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 to think that would be above MacArthur's first order to Hirohito. I mean, so this notion of sacrifice and, and, and of... Uh, uh, it is amazing. And, and, and if for people who were around at that time could vouch for it, for those of us who were not around, uh, it's just, it just remarkable that, that, that so much was expected on, at the home front and how much was you had to give up next because they're, they're going to get exciting. Uh, the, the requisite war ends. Uh, very happy, man. We have several shots of this, of uh, soldiers. <laughs> this was a good time to be a smoocher. And, of course, this guy was a uh, West Sider. So move on. Uh, had to throw that in. Ah, one of my personal favorites. These are, Mr. Mazzola, Mr. Morrow, Italian prisoners. These, wait, they just lost the war. Don't they really look chagrined? Many, many of the, Chicago, many of the, many of the uh, uh, prisoners, they just no room. They send them to, and they were doing these kinds of, of jobs. And as, I, as you research it, one of the great problems wasn't that they would break out and do that. One of them, they would break out, get lost, and stay in America. I mean, you know, they fought and fought and didn't want to go back. But I just thought that was great. Hey, we lost. Uh, <laughs> anyways, I just thought that's a great shot. Go ahead. Next. We're almost done. Uh, there's Navy Pier, as, uh, uh, as Mel talked about, that, that would become the, the University of Illinois Chicago until Mayor Daley decided that perhaps it should be a more... S oh. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Mr. Mayor, can't take the call. Next. Uh, one, only two shots left. The baby boom age, we have a big section on how America after the war changed. This is 55th and Dorchester. For all you University of Chicago Hyde Park people, you know a baby boom area if there ever was one. Uh, not only do we put in the show the baby boomers, but I, I love the old architecture. Look at those buildings. Uh, none of them are still up. Uh, next. And, of course, this is the last one, war changes everything. Chicago has to change with the war. There is Harry Truman with, of course, Patty Baller. <laughs> War's over. Life goes on. Chicago ain't ready for reform. And uh, Harry Truman made many visits to Chicago uh, prior to the, uh, the, the 48 uh, uh, campaign. Illinois obviously was crucial. You all know the story of Jacob Arby trying to dump him for Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, Steve Neal, God rest his soul, you know, we used to talk about that uh, often. Uh, and that uh, he was very unsure of what Chicago Democrats would be doing. And so he spent a lot of time here. And uh, he's also very concerned about that ticket that they were putting together in 48 that was an obviously loser you know, Paul Douglas for Senate and Adley Stevenson for governor. Throwaways, because they knew they couldn't win, so they might as well get rid of these two yo-yos so that, you know. So all this was working against Truman. So he spent a lot of time here. And, of course, he spent time discussing probably the Marshall Plan with, uh, <laughs> with Patty Bowler. Is that it? Or is there one more left? That's it. Okay, we'll be happy to take questions. Step 
right up to the microphone, if you dare. Paul, oh, that conversation with Truman is not true. Patty Baller was trying to persuade Truman to go with him to Hong Kong. That was the whole conversation. Well, I certainly don't have any respect. <laughs> Seldom am I tongue tied. Uh, <laughs> I take it back. I take it back. Any questions at all about the time, the book, the era, or was this presentation? Oh, someone's got it. Berkowitz, you got to ask one of your. Oh, where do we buy the book? <laughs> right over by that gentleman right there, I guess. Oh, really? Oh, And we'll be happy to sign him. Okay, Mr. Berkowitz. I never thought I'd say this, but thank goodness you're asking a question. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no. Paul's book is available at how much? Twenty dollars plus tax, and Mel and Paul sign them. And I think they should just come up here afterwards, right up here. Yeah, they should go right over here. Go ahead, Jeff. Jeff Berkowitz. I'm in the for-profit business. Paul's in the not-for-profit. So buy his book. You can see a little difference here. <laughs> Jeff Berkowitz, host and producer of Public Affairs airing every Monday night at 8.30, Channel 21, Can TV. Tonight's show, tonight's show, Republican candidate for the United States Senate, Jack Ryan. No plus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. Remember, I've been on your show twice, so make Paul Green has been here twice, and we'll try to get him back a third time. What are you doing this week, Paul? Okay. Uh, you, you took sh several shots at the president, President George W. Bush, and perhaps the effort in general with the war on terrorism or the, or the war in Iraq or the war in Afghanistan, apparently you don't think the United States people are sacrificing enough as they did in World War II. But times are different. I mean, I, would you have him raise taxes, which some people, many people, certainly people in the administration, you don't want me saying some people, and this speaker included, would be counterproductive. That would simply slow down the recovery. That would slow down growth. That would give you less total tax revenue. So the question is, what do you want, what would you like George W. Bush to do to order the appropriate sacrifice of the American people to win the various wars we're engaged in now? Mel. Well, what, <laughs> one thing he could do is to imitate the performance of of President Nixon when he was in the White House, and that is that he Vietnamized the Vietnam War, not being fought by American troops, but just American advisors, whereas the American losses in Iraq and Afghanistan continue, which disturbs all kinds of voters who are seeing people lost. So if he were to Iraqize that war by, say, removing American troops from combat and using them only for advisors, that would help him a great deal because American casualties would drop. Uh, directly to your question, though, I think the, the, the point I was trying to make, and the point we're making verbally, is that it's not what he could do, it's what the country could do. You saw a country totally mobilized to right. try and fight a war, home and abroad. That is not the case today. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying it's a different, it's a different era, and you, when, obviously a different enemy. We were fighting nations. But when you, when, you, when you look at these photos and when you see what these folks were doing, uh, everybody, the kind of spirit, uh, it's just a different time. You're right, it is a different time, but the kind of uh, 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 patriotism and loyalty uh, is just not there. Now, it hasn't been there in Vietnam. It wasn't even there in Korea. Uh, this, was, this was the war, and so maybe we can never recapture it. Maybe the people coming along, we had the greatest generation, and all of us who followed are not quite up to, up to where they were, but whatever the reason is, uh, the, the, the commitment, uh, you know, we have people belly aching about gas prices going above two dollars, which is, you know, everyone gets an outrage. Uh, well, in those days, you couldn't buy gas no matter what the price. I right? think that's the big difference. But maybe one, one follow up then, this is for you, Dr. Green. Maybe as they used to say, politics ends at what, uh, at the shore's end and we have a bipartisan approach to foreign policy. It used to be when the nation was at war, both parties rallied around whoever had initiated that and supported it. That is no longer true, right? Maybe that's what you're talking about. Per perhaps, perhaps. Remember, John Dewey did run against Roosevelt in '44. So perhaps if Karl Rove would volunteer to fight in Baghdad, that could be a first step. 
<laughs> Quite a while I'm ahead. I'm Joyce Saxon on the board of City Club. Paul, Mel, I don't have a question for you. I just want to share something that probably Alderman Nateris knows. I sure didn't know when I went to Hawaii this January, and I was on the deck of the Missouri with the colonel, and he told us the scene that went on when the Japanese came aboard to surrender. And President Truman had called for every American serviceman in the vicinity who was over seven foot tall to put on their dress uniforms and be lined up against the Japanese as they clambered aboard. And I thought that was a wonderful story. Okay. Yes, sir. It was a wonderful program. My name is Perry Branson. I'm a retired judge, and I served in Vietnam, and presently I'm chairman of the Board of Norwegian American Hospital. And it seems to me that... Uh, there appears to be a lack of courage in our Congress to pass what I believe to be a, necess a, a, a necessity, namely the institution of the draft, because uh, there seems to be no sense of community. Now, whether or not that draft is for the Marine Corps, the Peace Corps, the Job Corps, many of our young people do not seem to have a sense of what it is to be an American. They've lost that connection. And you made reference here to the kind of sacrifices that were made by Americans generally. And I think that somewhere along the line, we have to summon up the courage to say, OK, we just can't rely on our reservists, that everybody has to chip in to whatever policing we're doing, whatever war we're doing. We have a commitment to the United States. That's part of what being an American represents. And I, I believe, I don't know. It would be interesting to get your thoughts on whether or not you think the institution of some kind of governmental service is a doable thing, or if it's such a political hot potato that nobody wants to address it because they're more interested in the election rather than what's good for the country. Very important question. I would only suggest to you that going back to my experience in the 1960s, when you talk about that generation that was really committed, it was committed partly in large part because of the draft. Uh, it's amazing when you get your draft notice how you become really politicized. Uh, I'm not sure that that, you know, maybe, maybe not. I think the one point you do make, most of the people making the decisions about whether we go to war or not have very few people they know, let alone family members, fighting. That's a big difference with World War II, where you had people volunteering to, you know, being athletes and everything else, uh, congressmen's sons, congressmen. Paul Douglas joined the Marines at the age of 50 in 1942. I mean, that is, now we don't want Dick Durbin in, in, in the Marines, for the record show. <laughs> but but, 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 but I, I, I do think that, that the draft, my only concern if you instituted the draft is you have to set up another federal bureaucracy to administer it. Unless you can get the grandchild of Mr. Hersey, you know, uh, John, what's his name, who ran the, the, the selective service. Uh, I, I, something needs to be done where the people who make the decisions also have to pay the price of those decisions. And that's all I would say. Mel, real quick. Well, yes. Well, if you look at, say, the history of draft laws in America, in 1863, during the Civil War, when the draft law was passed, there were riots in Detroit, Chicago, and New York City of workers who did not want to go to war to free black slaves because they would flood the labor market. And so the first successful draft law passed in 1917. There were questions about it, but it finally was accepted. And then, of course, in 1940, the draft law passed again. And that had the most support of all the draft laws in American history. And of course, uh, President Nixon abolished the draft in 1971-72 because the war was becoming so unpopular with the American public. And he was easily reelected by a large number. And so we haven't had the draft since 1971-72. And as Paul suggested, it's politically quite dangerous because it would have a negative effect upon who the president is. So I don't think the draft laws will be reenacted before this conflict in Iraq is over. The other problem, as you suggest, is that, of course, the, there are fewer and fewer volunteers for the National Guard right now, reserve units, because they're nationalized very quickly and sent into Afghanistan or Iraq. Uh, identify yourself, please, sir. 
Yes, I'm Chuck Middleton, president of Roosevelt University, and uh, it's very nice to be following you around, Paul, and hearing uh, hearing more of your uh, good insights into uh, the history of this wonderful city that we have the pleasure of living in. I, uh, I'm not interested in your politics, or I'm not, surely not interested in what you have to think about current events. I want to go back to the book. Good. Um, because we have authors here. And I agree with you, sir. Yeah, it's very good. That's You should always do that. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, we have authors here, and so I have a question for you two as authors. Which took longer, writing the words or picking the pictures, and why? <laughs> well, what a great question. Outstanding question. <laughs> I'll be tap dancing pretty soon. Uh, picking the pictures uh, was, finding the pictures was the toughest, as I said at the beginning. Thanks to John Cruikshank, we were able to, to really, and the city of Chicago, as always, were really nice to us. The people in the, uh, in the various offices there, uh, uh, our good friend John Camper uh, and a former UIC guy, and uh, they were all very nice. But the toughest part was finding the war pictures. As Samantha knows, I thought I'd have an easy shot with the Chicago Tribune. I found out that I had no shot with the Chicago Tribune. They passed us around and passed us around. and so. It was the Sun Times coming in, and, and and then a few others that really came through with a lot of photos, and uh, then it became what do we leave out, and so we decided, and you know, Mel could fill it in, but to make it a complete book by doing a forward and a postscript. But finding the finding the photos was uh, the the war photos were really tough because a lot of the records were 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 simply uh, the the photos are gone. We want about it. Yes, I think you're correct. The photo search was it really involved because some, even some archives, if they have photos, they may be in a personal collection. They could be in file seven, eight, or 10, and they're not identified by the inventories. And so it took a lot of searching to find these critical photos. Mel, didn't the Chicago Historical Society have? Yes, they have some photos too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Trouble with the Chicago Historical Society is that they're- We a, recognized them for a few of the photos in the book. Yes, they are, but a lot of their photos are uh, well, you think you're buying it from the Louvre. Uh, yes. Hey, uh, Judith Reese, uh, trustee emerita of University of Illinois. I have a couple of comments. First, um, <clears throat> we all know there was all this D-Day coverage on television, all saturation during the weekend. Uh, last night on Book TV, uh, Stephen Ambrose uh, talked about when he, on June 6th, Franklin Delano Roosevelt led a national prayer on the radio for the success of the, of the operation in Normandy. And talking about how different, what, how times are so different right now. Just think of how, um, what kind of a brouhaha that might provoke right now if the President of the United States did that. But he said he and his family were down on their knees in front of the radio praying with the president. The other comment I'd like to make, the reason that the current military brass in the Pentagon is so opposed to the draft is that because it produces such high casualties. They don't want to be there, and they're in for only maybe two years. That was the reason that casualties were so high in Vietnam. There was a two-year stint, and nobody, and they didn't want to be there. And they weren't trained very well. They weren't trained very long. Yes, 800 plus casualties is a lot, but it's nothing compared to 58,000 in, in, in Vietnam or 600,000 for World War II. Okay. No comment from, from me. I, no. We didn't cover that. I have a comment. Oh, just, but, yes, sir. I'm Dean Larson, and when I was a senior, we took a cruise on the Greater Detroit from Navy Pier, and it was the sister ship of the Wolverine. Okay, these we ships were the largest side wheelers in the world, 34 feet in diameter, 15 boilers, the connecting rods 18 inches in diameter, 22 feet long, and there was one high pressure cylinder and two low pressure cylinders. The engineers stood there and felt the water as they adjusted each time it went along, and it went 29 and a half knots, or 35 miles an hour. Boy, how's that? Anyone want to disagree with that? Interesting. Yeah, all of them. I, I submit to you that the reason that the wars are different is because of the weapons. World War II was an extension 
extensive war. We were, we were fighting uh, uh, tyrannical uh, groups, but they didn't have the atomic bomb. And uh, that is why everybody is so cautious. Uh, there was, there, I don't know who said it, but uh, I know what weapons were uh, used in World <coughs> War II. I know what weapons are going to be used in World War III. And the weapons that will be used in World War IV are rocks. And um, Norman Corwin said that. Uh, that's, I think, is the biggest fear of all of war. I think we would have had another <coughs> World War if the atomic bomb and those chemical uh, bomb, uh, chemical warfare items uh, worked on the horizon at the same time. I think that's the biggest fear of anything of, all, of, of our troops in, in going to war, is the fact that the casualties and the, who do you know, what do you, you know, we're talking about these terrorist groups, uh, the, the ones that are, the ones that we hear about today that are the most terrifying are the ones that are coming out of Russia. And uh, if you, can, you can make an atomic bomb yourself today. Uh, it's not that difficult. And you might find some a person that's off the edge, mentally at least that's what we think, who gets the idea that uh, why not set off the bomb? Why not blow up half the world? Who cares? And that, I think, is the difference in, in wars and feelings of people. But I think what this gentleman says about uh, the draft is true, but I don't like to call it the draft. I think every person, man or woman, should serve two years government service. It doesn't have to be in the army, it could be in the government, and uh, it will also help the employment problem. You see, where they could come out also with a skill of some kind and come back into society and work. Now, there are other nations in the world that doesn't. And uh, if you want to know the major source of personnel in Israel, for the police department, it's the men and women that serve two years in the army. Uh, they like to fire guns, and uh, after the two or three years in the army, then they go to work for the police. I saw a woman in Israel with a uh, with a light machine gun, and she fired at the target, and the only thing that happened was the hole got larger. I'm sorry it took so long, but I have that happen. <laughs> yes, oh, Marty, what? Uh, just an, an observation about uh, the difference between these two wars and why uh, the president and the country can't seem to be rallied for this war we're in now as they were in World War II. Uh, uh, for those who have studied the war or lived it or know people, family and so on, World War II was an extraordinarily sweeping thing that had so much drama to it Compared to this Iraq situation, it's, it, it's just so overshadowed, there's no comparison. Even Vietnam and Korea, you know, you had massive armies sweeping, the, the German army sweeping through France and the lowlands and then sweeping all the way 2,000 miles to Moscow and Stalingrad and then getting swept back by the Russians, you know, four or 5,000 miles of, of distance with millions of men and their armies, the Japanese occupying a third of China, uh, uh, the, the Japanese occupying six, seven, eight hundred or six, seven thousand square miles, which is twice the size of the United States and Southeast Asia, sweeping huge things and the casualties, 20, 30, 40, 50 million people, not 800 a day or 5,000 wounded. It, it was just extraordinary. It lasted for uh, six years. Cities were absolutely leveled. You know, again, if you look at 9-11, uh, it's a terrible thing and it's, it's tragic. But if you take it in size and scope, it's about two square blocks that have been eliminated in all of Manhattan and all of the country. You look at these newsreels or those who were in World War II, the whole city of Berlin and areas of London, they were just nothing, rubble, Warsaw, uh, Stalingrad, a million cities, just rubble, nothing. And so the sweep of those two things and to try to make a comparison with a terrorist attack and they uh, kill 25 people in a restaurant and then three weeks or a month or two, a year later, another 15 people, uh, there, there is no comparison. And I, you can't force through PR and through promotion and hype to get people that enthusiastic to do all the things that you so showed up there, sacrifice and giving up and all this and that. The, the scope and sweep and drama 
just isn't there and they can't, oh, all the media can't generate it. And, and John, in, in your newspaper and all the other media, they can't generate because it's not so. If you take the, the scope and the uh, uh, overness of, of World War II, that's why, again, I think Vietnam and, and Korea didn't have the same appeal to the public uh, to, to get behind it. So it was over, worldwide sweeping. Just a comment on the comparisons. All right, you know the City Club is famous for comments. I mean, that's part of our game plan. Uh, thank you. Uh, question. Well, more of a statement. My name is Alan Pomerantz. Uh, I'm with A. Epstein and Sons in Chicago. <clears throat> and um, just wanted to make a comment. I, I really enjoyed seeing the, the book looks wonderful, by the way. Uh, I specifically enjoyed seeing the pictures of the Wolverine and the Sable. I'm personally involved with the Midway Memorial Project. Uh, which deals a lot with, with the aircraft carriers and the airplanes and the training uh, that took place in Lake Michigan. The, um, the steamers were originally named the C&B and the New Buffalo, by the way, and were converted in 1942. And one of the photographs you have there shows the two aircraft carriers in the Ogden Slip next to, uh, next to uh, Navy Pier. Um, later this summer, um, an SBD Dauntless dive bomber will be delivered to Midway Airport and will be put in the A concourse at Midway um, to commemorate the Battle of Midway and the flyers that flew there and the, the training that took place in Chicago. And um, it's something that'll be a, uh, a real star in the cap of Chicago to have a memorial like that uh, within our city. Well, thank you. Sure. Uh, by the way, we do have photos in the picture uh, in the book of the great Merle C. Miggs. Remember, remember, remember Miggs Airport? Yep, yeah, yeah. We got that. And 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 for one, and, and of course, Mel talked about Butch O'Hare, and you all know about his dad, uh, right. uh, the guy who ratted out Al Capone. And ten years after that, he was gunned down on on Ogden Avenue in Chicago because. Though the war was fought, this city still operates under the same rules. Uh, so Butch O'Hare's dad uh, got whacked, as we like to say, uh, 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 for ratting out Al Capone. That's a little tidbit that we just throw in to, for all you boosters of the city. Last question. Yeah, yes. one last thing. I want to thank you very much for the cover. My name is Ralph Ridehome. I'm retired. I used to run an ad agency. Uh, which is also pretty much retired at the moment. <laughs> but uh, I want to thank you for the cover because I was uh, an official paper trooper during World War II and collected enough paper that Sheriff Hugh Mulcahy presented me with a Silver Sheriff Star, which is still one of my absolute favorite uh, member, uh, member, pieces of memorabilia. And I would like right now to be the first person here to buy your book. Well, thank, thank you very much. W were you a Boy Scout? or? No, uh, the, it wasn't a scouting thing. It was anybody who wanted to collected paper yes. in paper drives, and uh, I somehow, with the help of my father and some and God, uh, the rest of the kids, and they they were also collecting as well. But I got enough to uh, to have, and I still have a picture actually. And uh, we found the only <laughs> the only sort of semi sport coat that would fit a small kid at the time, and it hung over my my hands and it was sort of an odd plaid and I still have a photo of it being given the uh, the silver star by and I always loved Sheriff Hugh Mulcahy I have no idea if he was in the fine tradition of all the rest of our sheriffs or not but I loved him well, that's <laughs> very good indeed. yep let me comment on the airplanes perhaps m many of you know that uh, some of the airplanes landing on these aircraft carriers crashed into Lake Michigan and as a matter of fact several have been wrought up by aircraft collectors, and I saw a P-51 and a Grumman fighter being rebuilt in Florida near Orlando, where there's an air base. And the Navy's policy is this, that if you pull up two aircraft, you can keep one, but you have to give one back to the Navy. But I think somebody mentioned Midway is gonna have an aircraft on display. And did they pull it out of Lake Michigan? Uh, yes, they did. Uh, actually, the aircraft uh, that's being installed at Midway was rec recovered out of Lake Michigan mm -hmm. in 1991 and was on display for a number of, it was restored and on, on display for a number of years uh -huh. at the uh, uh, National Museum of Naval Aviation in Pensacola and then was borrowed by the Army and sent to the uh, United States Air Force Museum in Dayton 
and mm -hmm. painted Army colors as an A-24. The Army used the SBD as a scout aircraft uh, later in the war. And um, when the airplane got committed to uh, be installed at Midway, was given back to the Navy and was painted, um, painted Navy colors again and shows um, the squadron markings from the USS Enterprise, mm -hmm. and, which was one of the you know, main uh, dive bomber squadrons uh, in the Battle of Midway. Unfortunately, this particular aircraft didn't fight at Midway. <coughs> it was used well, specifically Well, that's okay. You know the old Chicago story. Never let the truth interfere with a good story. <laughs> Listen, let's have a nice round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. In addition to the round of applause, why don't you consider buying one of Paul and Mel's books, and then they'll sign it for you. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.